We see it's important for us to be able to identify and correspond the name of a substance to the elements, atoms, ions that are present within that substance. So as we're looking at what a compound is, whether it's an ionic compound or a molecular compound, so we want to be able to speak the language of chemistry and be able to describe what atoms or elements or ions are present in a substance based upon the corresponding name. Because I don't want to have to always say NaHCO3. I want to be able to describe that substance in a quicker name that tells me what is present there. So I'd say sodium bicarbonate. So we're trying to correspond a chemical structure with a, a name that corresponds to that. And we also want to make it where one name matches up with only one chemical structure. So we don't want to make it ambiguous. And so we're going to see there's certain things that we're going to do to be able to make sure one name matches one chemical structure. So we're going to talk about naming binary which would mean there are two different elements combined, ionic and molecular compounds. As we're thinking of naming binary molecular ionic compounds, as we're looking at this, we want to think about what kind of compound is there? Can we identify its molecular ionic? If we find that it's ionic, we need to find out what are the two ions that are present in that binary compound. From there, if in that ionic compound, the metal can make multiple charges, and let me think about where those metals might be. Those tend to be transition and post transition metals. These are metals that can make multiple possible charges. Not every single transition metal makes multiple different charges. We'll look at which ones can and how do we describe the charge that they would be. Finally, what we want to do is look at if it's a molecular compound, we're going to use a prefix to name the number of atoms. That's because they can combine in a lot of different ratios. So let's look at each of these separately and say how we can identify the name of a compound from the formula. So as we're kind of speaking the language of chemistry, trying to name these compounds, let's start with our ionic compounds. With an ionic compound, we can see here, these are com combinations of positive and negative ions, a metal, which is our positive ion, and a non-metal, and our negative ion. Or one of them might be a polyatomic ion. So we're looking at a polyatomic ion that might be present in that compound. So as we're doing this, what we need to do is be able to identify what the two elements are, the ions that are present, uh, and then find that they only combine in one possible ratio. So there's not multiple ratios that, for example, magnesium and sulfur can combine in. They will only combine one sulfur, one magnesium together to make this compound. We're never gonna see something like that. Two magnesiums and one sulfur, we're not gonna see something like this with magnesium and three sulfurs. Those are not ways that magnesium combines naturally with sulfur, and this is based upon the ion charges that we find for each of these. So as we're identifying the name of this compound, we need to identify what are the two ions that we have there. So with magnesium and sulfur, we go to the periodic table and we can identify the charge that these elements would be. So as we look at these two elements, we find magnesium here and sulfur here, and we see that magnesium is in group two, meaning it makes a plus two charge. Likewise, sulfur is in group 16, meaning it makes a negative two charge. It gains two electrons to get to our noble gas group. Uh, that's how many electrons it needs to make that full octet for its valence shell. We also can observe, based upon where these two elements are, that sulfur is a non-metal, whereas magnesium is a metal. And we can kind of see here the separation between our metals and our non-metals is this kind of stepladder metalloid area. So everything to the left and down, those would be our metals, and everything to the right and up would be our non-metals. And these are based upon their chemical and physical properties that we'd see for them. So now we've identified the charge of magnesium and the charge of sulfur, and we can go back to looking at how they would break apart if we looked at these two ions. So we see that magnesium will break up into a plus two ion and a sulfur negative two ion for our MGS. Now we wanna look at those two and say, how are we gonna name this? So I need to name my positive ion. We always write first the positive ion name, followed by second, the negative ion name as we're naming this. So we have our positive ion magnesium, and that's also typically why our positive ions are written first. So that would mean I'm gonna use 
whatever the normal name on the periodic table is for that positive ion. So that would be magnesium for our positive ion. And then our negative ion, we're gonna change it a little bit to illustrate that it is a negative ion. We're gonna take the normal name of that element and we're going to remove the ending of it. U R for sulfur. And we're gonna add the IDE ending, which is gonna tell us that this is a negative ion that we have here. So this becomes sulfide. So we have magnesium, sulfide would be the name for this chemical compound. We don't need to add anything different for magnesium to say it's an ion. Now we also might see, for example, uh, I-N-E endings for something like chlorine and fluorine. That becomes I'd, just like sulfide. We also might see something like EGN, which is oxygen's ending, and that also becomes I-D-E. So we see that we're always adding just the I-D-E ending to the negative ion in our ionic compound. This is when magnesium, our positive ion, only makes one possible charge. We don't have to add any other information. Let's look at an example of what happens when we have an element that can make multiple charges and how do we indicate that name matches that chemical formula. So for example, if we have Fe2O3, we see this is the metal iron with the non-metal oxygen. And again, we identify that based upon where it is in the periodic table. So now we go and we see, well, this is gonna break up into iron, but we go to the periodic table and we see iron's a transition metal. It can make a couple different charges. What we need to do is figure out what is the charge that it actually is in this specific compound. We're gonna do that by looking at what it's partnered with. We know for sure that oxygen is gonna make that negative two charge. It's the same group as sulfur, meaning it's gonna make a negative two charge just like sulfur. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this information to identify what the charge is for iron. Now, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna know that the sum of all the charges for iron plus all the charges for oxygen is gonna be zero or neutral. Now again, we're using the subscripts of iron and oxygen to tell us how many we have in this specific formula unit. So then we could say, well, I don't know what iron is. I know oxygen is negative two. That's gonna equal zero. So I find iron makes a plus three charge in this specific compound. That means now I know what charge iron is in this specific compound. Now I can go back and name this compound using that information. So again, I'm gonna start with my positive ion, iron, followed by my negative iron, my negative ion, oxygen, but again, we're going to get rid of that EGN ending and we're gonna add IDE. So oxygen becomes oxide. Now, if I leave it like that, this name right here is ambiguous because we don't actually know how many irons and oxygens are combining in iron oxide because iron can make a plus two charge and this plus three charge. This name doesn't correspond to a specific ion. So what we need to do is we need to add information about the charge of that ion. We're gonna do that by tagging along the ending of iron its charge. So that iron three in Roman numerals is telling us that our iron makes a plus three charge in this specific compound. So this would be the name of our iron three oxide, which would be Fe2O3. So let's go ahead now and look at our molecular compounds. Our molecular compounds, again, we can identify based upon what are the kinds of elements present in this compound. So if there are two or more nonmetals, that would mean it's telling us that it is a molecular compound or covalent, however we want to describe that. So it only contains nonmetals. What's important about our molecular compounds is that these molecular compounds can combine in a lot of different possible ratios. Uh, this is the, the idea of law of multiple proportions. Now we need to have a name that corresponds to one specific compound. I wanna look at an example of a few different nitrogen and oxygen compounds that combine in different ratios. Here we have NO2 and then we have N2O5. 
we want to have a name that matches that specific compound. So again, we have nitrogen and oxygen. And when we're naming this, we're going to kind of start in a similar manner as we did with our ionic compound. So as we're doing that, we're going to name first whatever is listed first. So that's going to be nitrogen. And then the second element, we're going to add the IDE ending, just like we did with our ionic compound. So this would be nitrogen oxide. Now, if we did that same thing for the one below, so that would be nitrogen oxide. That would mean they have the same name. We can't do that, really. We need to have a name that matches one specific compound. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a prefix in front of each of these to tell us how many nitrogens and oxygens we have. If I have one for my first element, I'm not gonna add mono at the beginning. And this is again only for whatever we list first. We're just gonna call it nitrogen. And then to say there's two oxygens with that nitrogen, we're gonna add the di prefix, so dioxide. So this would be nitrogen dioxide. Whereas if we look at our N2O5, we have two nitrogens, meaning it would be dinitrogen. And then we have five oxygens. Five means we're gonna add penta. So this would be dinitrogen pentoxide. Now, if we see something, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here where we see some usual things. If we say AO, we're not gonna call it pentaoxide. It's just weird to say and I think just doesn't make sense. So we're gonna get rid of that A and it just becomes pentoxide. So it should be penta, but because we have those two vowels next to each other, it becomes pentoxide. So now we have two unique, distinct names for these two different compounds. And again, we had to name how many we have of each in order to differentiate this specifically because these are the molecular compounds that can combine in a lot of different ratios. So hopefully that gives us some background in how we can describe and name these compounds looking at a few different examples. If you want to hang out a little bit longer, I'm going to show us a few more examples of how we might name some molecular ionic compounds. I'm going to give us a compound and we got to first figure out what kind of compound it is first. So as an example, if we have something like this, CaCO3, I go ahead and I look at this substance and I see here calcium. I look at my periodic table. That is a metal. Whenever I see a metal, that's a hint that this is going to be ionic compound because our covalent compounds don't include metals. We also see here that we have this combination of multiple non-metals. If we see that with our metal, that might mean a hint that this is a polyatomic ion. Now what we mean by polyatomic ion, poly multiple atom ions. So this would be something where I'd see, okay, I have calcium making a plus two charge because it is group two. I know it is plus two. Then I have CO3. CO3, we look at our kind of table of ionic polyatomic ions, we see that it makes a two minus charge, which makes sense why they combine with a one to one ratio. So now we have these two elements and ions that we'd see as we're combining these. And now we can go ahead and name this based upon the fact that we know this is an ionic compound. All right, so that would mean I'm gonna have first calcium followed by second, the name of that polyatomic ion, carbonate. Again, we don't need to say how many we have of each. We're just labeling the two different ions that we have present here. So let's look at another one. Let's say we have CF4. Why don't you pause the video and see if you can name this before we talk this through. Now that we had a chance to look at this one, what we might see as we're kind of identifying this compound, we have two different non-metals. They're both non-metals, which lets us know this would be a molecular or covalent compound. So that would mean I need to name the two elements and how many we have of each one. So the first one would be carbon. And again, we don't add that mono 
And again, we don't add that mono prefix because this is the first element. If it is the second element, we do add that mono prefix. So we have carbon followed by our fluorine, but again, we end up removing that I-N-E ending and it becomes I'd. So now we have carbon, fluoride. However, we need to say how many fluorines we have because this is a covalent compound that would be tetra. So tetra is four. So that'd be carbon tetrafluoride would be the name of this molecular compound. So we've had lots of practice with these and now it's your turn to go ahead and see, can you take some chemical formulas and go and provide the name for them?